Good evening, everyone. I appreciate you all for being here tonight. You could have been anywhere else. It is Thursday. Y'all could be watching the basketball game or doing anything else. So you guys are in here with us. Today, we're going to go over these estate plan documents. All right. Uh, reason being we're going to go over these documents is because uh, recently I had some signings where the notary I had three notaries, three consecutive signings uh, where there were uh errors that are made on these documents and the instructions were clearly laid out on how the signing was supposed to be completed. So that lets me know that one, they're either not reviewing the materials or two, they just don't have a thorough understanding of how to perform an estate plan signing or three, they just don't follow instructions. So either one of those, uh, <coughs> excuse me, either one of those will be the case. So what we're gonna do today, <coughs> excuse me, hold on y'all. Ooh, excuse me, that sounds stuck in my throat. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over some uh, estate plan documents that you're common that you're that's the most common documents that you're going to see in your estate plan signings. Typical estate plan signings, depending on what type of plan that the signer is setting up, can be between a hundred up to two hundred twenty-five pages. The most that I've seen. Uh, to, we're not going to go through an entire uh, state plan package because for the most part, it's just like loan signings. It could be a lot of filler documents that's not that's going to be irrelevant. Uh, for the most part, what we're going to do today is focus on, again, documents that you're going to see, documents that need to be signed. Uh, and also, you want to get familiar with these type of documents as well. Um, <clears throat> every state plan signing is not going to go the same. So you'll have some signings where the attorney will be there present with you and they'll be able to explain the documents and everything to the signers. And then you are gonna have some situations where it's just you with the signer and the signer may have a question about what does this docu document mean? Would you be able to thoroughly explain it to me just a little bit what the, what's the meaning of this document? So again, that's the purpose of this class. Now also uh, I wanna include as well, um, again, it's not your job, to explain the particulars as to why their living trust is set up a particular way. Again, leave that up to the attorney. Uh, the attorney pretty much does the majority of the work for you. But again, you want to be up, be well familiar with these type of documents. Reason being is sidetrack. Um, as of late, I've been not as of late, but this whole year I've been doing a ton of power of attorneys and advanced health care directors. So some of those those single documents you're actually going to see in a state plan signing just by seeing those frequently, that's going to help you be prepared when you just have a general notary work assignment, whether it's just for an advanced healthcare directive or a general, general durable power of attorney. So I'm pretty sure y'all are ready to get started. Uh, again, for anyone that's just come in, uh, please mute yourself. If you have kids, trust me, I understand. I got two kids myself. They may want to come up to you. They want a Capri Sun. They want a, some goldfish or some cheeses at the last minute while you're trying to get educated. Just out of respect for everyone else, please make sure you put your uh, put, uh, mute your mic. And if you have any questions, we will, if we have some time left for Q&A, well, I'll make sure to do so. I'm pretty sure you all will have some questions and uh, we'll go from there. So let me share my screen. Hold on. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, no, y'all. I'm trying to... Why is it not? I'm going to turn it off. No? I cook it downstairs, man. Can you mute yourself, please? Whoever is talking, let me see how you look. Bam, there we go. <clears throat> Do me a favor, y'all. Can you drop a three in the chat for me if you can see my screen? Drop a three in the chat for, if you can see my screen. Excellent, excellent. Okay, great. <clears throat> so commonly when you uh, in your estate plan signings, again, this is going to be the most common documents that you're going to see and that you need to be prepared for. Uh, so the first doc common document that you're going to see, this document is called the Uniform Statutory Form Power of Attorney. Uh, this document is pretty much stating that the sign that the principal is giving their agent, uh, allowing their agent to act on their behalf to make uh, for uh, <clears throat> to have powers to make um, financially related uh, decisions, to have the power to make those kind of decisions based on uh, it could be for stocks, it could be for real estate, it could be for business, uh, it could be for uh, 
any type of investment accounts. So it's going to give you a list of powers that, that, that the principal may want their agent to have powers over. If the, if the signer just has a, a, a specific uh, subjects that they want their agent to have power over, they would just initial in these specific areas. Now, like most complex, as commonly as I've seen in most signings, <clears throat> they're going to have, they're pretty much going to initial here. So if they want, so if the signer wants their, uh, excuse me, if, their princ if the principal wants their agent, in fact, to have uh, have powers or have all the powers listed above, just have them initial here only. If you initial have, if you have them initial each one, I mean, that's not fine. That's fine. Uh, it's not going to hold up the signing, but just for efficiency reasons, you just want to have them initial in and you will be set to go. <clears throat> and then after you, after you get their initial here, the next step is you want to get a signature. We're going to get their signature here on the second page. And then we want to make sure we get this notarized as well. All right. Still got some folks. We need to mute some people. Or is it just me? Everybody muted? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah, that's the uh, uniform statutory foreign power of attorney. Again, we're just going to get their signature, make sure we get this document signed and notarized. Uh, typically, if you see this section where it says acknowledgement of agent, this section is going to be for the principal's agent uh, to sign. If they're not present at the signing, that's perfectly fine. Uh, just encourage the signer at some point in time to have their, uh, to have their agent sign this document and then you should be all set. So the next common document that you're gonna come across is the California Advanced Healthcare Directive, also known as the Advanced Healthcare Directive. And with this document, this, this document is basically letting the principal know that the principal can give, the, uh, can give their agent uh, powers over their, health, over their healthcare decisions. So you'll see, I don't have the documents included in here, but you'll see a few additional documents in your signings where the attorney will have the documents laid out and then it will give these the principal um, options as regards to if they wanna have the, the choice to either prolong their life or they just want to just pull the plug. They do have the option on those specific documents, on, on those documents. Um, typically they're either going to be already, been, already be filled in for you ahead of time, or if you're already with the sign already and it's blank, you could just fill, you could just fill that information in. So again, this is the Advanced Healthcare Directive. This document is the principal is just pretty pretty much uh, letting the principal know that they let they can give their agent uh, powers over their healthcare decisions, whether if they want to have the choice to prolong their life, or they want to have the choice to further or just pull the plug in general. All right. And once we get to the next page, so it's about six or seven. Again, the, the other ancillary pages, you're not really going to worry about. Only probably, only page you will need to worry about is just the page that need to be signed. <clears throat> if you see this section where it says primary physician, again, this uh, this section is optional. You can have the signers fill that information in here, uh, there what, while you're there at the signing. But if they don't, if they choose not to sign it right then and there. That's perfectly fine. It's not going to hold up the process. Just make sure you get their date, get their signature, get their printed name, make sure all this information is correct. And then that's how you will fill out the uh, California Advanced Healthcare Directive. Now, I just want to add, I'm pretty sure we have some notaries here. That's from other states. Uh, even though it says this is a California advanced health care, uh, e even if it was a Tennessee, if, if it was Tennessee, if it was New York or any other state, the documents are pretty much going to remain the same. The only difference is you would just check your state laws mm -hmm. to see if it's, if it's common for the, for, for the advanced health care directive to have uh, witnesses for that document. That's the only thing I would encourage you to check. But for the most part, the title of the documents may, may be different because you live in a, in a different state, but the documents are going to always, the meaning of the purpose of the documents are going to always remain the same. So the next document that we're going to run into <clears throat> is called the authorization for release. Yes, let's drop something. Can y'all do me a favor? Can you mute yourselves for me, please? Thank you. All right, so next we have the authorization for release of the signer's protected health information, also known as the HIPAA authorization form. 
So you may there may be a situation, let's say if I, if I'm in, if I happen to be in the hospital and my, my, my wife may be with me and the doctor may have may have some uh, information that's really important about my health that my wife should know. Well, if she's if I don't have if she doesn't have a HIPAA author, if I don't have her listed as my agent in my HIPAA authorization form, by law, the doctor or the hospital cannot share that cannot share my medical information with her. So that's why you see documents like this. So if the principal is in a hospital and they're going through dealing with some health related issues. By law, the by law, the uh, the hospital cannot share that medical cannot share the principal's medical information with anybody that's not listed inside the HIPAA authorization form, or if they just don't have it signed in general. So typically, when you come across these estate plans, you come across these estate plan documents. This is one of the very important documents that you're going to see. And this document also requires to be notarized as well. <clears throat> so when you see this document, just know that it's going to uh, it's going to ask for the principal signature, and it's also going to ask for it to be signed and notarized by yourself as well. So this is a very important document. Please don't miss this as well. And some of the cool and also one of the benefits of um, of these uh, type of uh, state plan signings that. You're going to have the attorney, typically the attorney may either send the documents to you or they're going to send the documents in a binder over to the principal, over to the signer. So by the time you get there, the documents are probably already, it's going to be pretty much a layup for you. They'll have the documents, uh, sticky notes and flags on which areas need to be signed and they'll have notes for you as well. So I just wanted to throw that in there as well. Next document that we're going to come across is the certification of trust. Uh, this document is basically stating that the signers are officially setting up their trust. Uh, it's basically laying out what powers that they have with inside the trust, whether it's with regards to purchasing property through the trust, whether it's to borrow money uh, through the trust, uh, who has, uh, what's, if it's a revocable or irrevocable trust as well. When you come across this type of document, uh, this typically, I, again, I got it narrowed down, but it's typically about 20 to 30 pages inside the certification of trust. And so when you come across this document, you just want to verify that the um, there are any um, inaccuracies in their names, the names are spelled correctly. Uh, they have the, the date of the trust correct as well. <clears throat> and then once you get to this very last page, it's going to ask for their signatures. And then this document is required to be notarized as well. Now, I've been asked this question before. But see, you'll see throughout the uh, throughout these throughout these type of signings that you'll see the verbiage like trustee or grantor. In most cases, just from my just from my experience, I don't know if this experience has been different for you all that have done these type of signings. But typically, the attorney the attorneys that I've worked with do not require uh, the notaries to have trustee verbiage uh, after after their signature. Now, if they um, if you do like I said, if you do book book this type of signing. You always want to ask the attorney first, because again, if it was a loan signing, then yeah, you would they they would require the signer to print trustee after their signature, but it's always follow up with the attorney first before uh, before proceeding, and you should get a pretty clear answer there. So the next document that we're going to come across this is the nomination of conservator, conservator for the person who's establishing the trust. So this document is basically stating if the principal were to be in a position where they needed a conservator, uh, they would they would they would uh, appoint the person that they have listed on these documents as the person that that, that have conservatorship over the uh, over the principal signer. So again, this is the nomination of conservator, and this document is basically basically stating that if the principal were to be in be uh, were to be placed in a position to where they would need a conservatorship that they will appoint the person that's listed inside this document to, to be their conservator over their estate. Again, you're gonna confirm that the information on this document is true and correct. After that, you wanna get a signature here. You wanna get a date. And this document does not need to be notarized. Uh, but the reason why, what's the reason why I include this document? Oh, the reason why I included this document inside this package is because one day you're gonna work with, you're gonna work with an attorney and most attorneys, most attorneys that I've worked with, especially for their out of office signings, they typically want scan backs of the signature and notarized pages. They want those pages to confirm that the signing, uh, what that the documents were signed with accuracy and that there aren't any errors. So when you come, when you are uh, 
knocking out your estate plan signings, expect to see this document. Expect to nine times out of 10 to see this document inside of a estate plan package. And again, it doesn't have to be notarized as well. So the next document that we're gonna come across will be the, the John Doe Living Trust. Uh, this document, I wanna say this might, I think this portion of the document for the Living Trust, this may be about 30 to 40 pages. And again, you uh, for, for this particular document, you would need to ex you would need to explain the purpose of this document. Uh, pretty much this, this is basically said, it, this document is basically, basically acknowledging that the principals are setting up their living trust and it's going to list everything that comes with uh, what's setting up their trust, what assets they, they are including, how instructions are need to be carried out, et cetera. It gets about 30 to 40 pages. Um, no initials are required for this type of document, but there are some instances where you'll see like throughout the, throughout the uh, documents, they may, it'll say the name of their living trust and it'll say dated and it's blank. You will see a section like that where you would just need to have these signers uh, provide uh, the date of what the, the day of their establishing their trust. And then you will be all set from there. And this document does need to be notarized as well. Now, let me pause real quick. Does anyone have any questions before I move on? Just want to pause real quick. Yes, I have a quick question. So for the that living trust, when you said that the signer needs to provide the date that um, they're establishing the trust, mm -hmm. does that typically form like in that day that the signing occurs or is that date already discussed with their attorney? So that, that's a great question. Yes, the, do you will put the date of the day that they're establishing a the trust. So that'd be the day that they're with you at the signing table. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great question. Does anyone else have any questions before we uh, proceed? No, all right, let's get it. So this document, <clears throat> this is the will. <laughs> And this document is the reason why we're doing this, is the reason why we're having this workshop today. Hold on real quick. So are all dates the same day? Yes, you wanna have the dates all for the same day. Yes, that's a great question as well. The dates will all be for the same day throughout the entire package. <clears throat> so this is the will, typically is either gonna be called a pour over will or the last will and testament. Uh, this is a common document that you're gonna come across. And again, this is the reason why I'm doing this workshop. So this document is pretty simple. Uh, this is basically just saying that uh, these are just uh, instructions for how I want my trust to be carried out. Uh, you know, when my time comes. Uh, also, for this, you want to get their signature. There's going to be a signature page for you there uh, for the will. But when you come across this document, this is the this is a really important page. I don't want you guys to gloss over. So here in California, and also in most states. Uh, the will requires two witnesses. It requires two witnesses and, and how you would properly fill out this document. And let's say if you, the notary, were serving as a witness, as you, can, you can't now, I just want to include this as well. As a notary, you can serve as a witness for the will as long as you're not notarizing it here in California. But I do know in states like uh, Texas, uh, the notary can serve as a witness for the will and notarize the document as well. So I just want to throw that in there. I also do encourage you to do your due diligence on your state laws. Don't get, don't be in hot water over listening to me over me, over me giving you the wrong information. Okay. So when you come across this document, two witnesses are required. Two witnesses are required for this document. If you as a notary are serving as the witness, this top line is going to be your signature. The second line is going to be where you would print your name. And this third line where you would print your address as well. And then you're going to have the second witness follow the same process as well. All right. Now, the reason why this is important, because I know at some point, uh, I don't know if you, some of you all are outsourcing your signings, but you're going to be in a position where you're going to have uh, an attorney that needs to get some documents signed and they're in the signings going to be in an area that you don't particularly serve, but you know a notary who does service that area. So you'll be able to forward the signing over to them. And you want to make sure that this document is signed completely because I had three consecutive signings where the, the notaries, they served as a witness. They filled this portion in, but they left this section out. <laughs> and then when you're missing the second witness signature, then they got to make a second trip. You got to coordinate the time with the signers to get the, the coordinated time with the witnesses to get the sign. 
and it could be a hassle and it could be it can really be an inconvenience so if you're for efficiency reasons you want to make sure two witnesses get your signature here top line second line printed name third line you want to put your address as well this is a real key document that you do not want to miss so if you got a thorough understanding of how to complete this document you're going to be you're going to be in good shape again um through most estate plan signings that I've had, that I've had, uh, this document is the one out where that, that always comes back with the most mistakes. And I think it's because they just don't have some notaries. I guess they don't, may not have an understanding of the laws when it comes to performing these type of documents. All right. Really quick cool question. I'm um, huh? sorry. No, go ahead. So I just want to kind of um, reiterate, make sure I'm understanding correctly. So for the sake of California, and of mm -hmm. course, like doing my own research, but you were say, stating that the notary can serve as a witness and can also notarize this or cannot? So in Texas, they can. In California, the notary can't serve as a witness and notarize the will. It can't, it has to dig either. If the will doesn't, typically in California, they, the, it, the, by law, it doesn't, the will isn't required to be notarized. So the notary can serve as a witness. But let's okay. say, but if you come across like a, like a last will in the testament where, um, where that does need to be notarized, uh, you wouldn't be able to, you, you can notarize the document, but you wouldn't be able to serve, you wouldn't be able to serve, to serve as a witness. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And typically like they, the um, attorney pretty much notifies the principal or, you know, whomever, mm -hmm. and they typically should have their witnesses. Yeah. So, 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 so that's definitely another great question as well. So mo in most cases, the attorney uh, definitely lets the principal know or let the signers know uh, that they would need uh, two non-partial witnesses. Obviously, the notary, if you're in California, the notary can serve as a witness. And if they if they are aware that they need to present a non uh, partial witness, <clears throat> it can't be it, it can't be anyone that's listed inside the documents. So if you're in a situation where the signer says, uh, I don't I don't have anyone who I can uh, bring on as a witness, then that that would be an opportunity for you as a notary to uh, to uh, opportunity for upsell. To where you can say, well, if you're not able to provide a witness, I'll be able to provide one for you. This is the fee what we charge to provide a witness. And if they want to get this taken care of, more than likely, they're just going to roll with it. Uh, what was the Do we use our home address or our business address? It's fine. Either or. <clears throat> you can either be your home address or you could be, or it could be a business address. Just know that a signature, a printed name, and an address is 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 required for this document. If those if those three if one of the three are missing, this document will be uh, invalid. Does the witness have to appear before the notary? Yes, the note. Yes, the witness does have to appear before the notary. Uh, so, in, from in, for my signings, when I come when I do the will, I typically have the no, I typically have the witness sign my journal and a right thumbprint, even though it's not required. Just for CYA purposes, cover your ass. I have the I have the witnesses do so. Would you write the date yourself and have them conform or have them do it? No, so ask because I haven't asked me to do it for them to slow nature. Uh, so typically, you would need to. Uh, so typically, for these type of documents, uh, the paralegal or the legal assistant who's helping the attorney draw the documents already it's already going to have the date on there anyway. So the only thing you would need to do is just make sure you get the just make the make sure you get that signature and then you will be all set. Can it be a PO address? Yes, it could be a PO box address. So it could be a home address, it could be a business address, or it could be a PO box address. It just needs to have an address on the document. If it is, if there, if one of the three are missing, this document will be considered uh, invalid. So really important, that, really important that you don't miss that. Anyone else have uh, any questions in regards to the will? If not, we'll move on. Great questions, you guys. So just to reiterate, the will requires two witnesses, signature, printed name, and address. It could be a PO box address, business address, or home address. If it's a la if it's a last minute if it's a last minute can the witness appear via via video chat? Ooh, that's a great question. I haven't never had I haven't had anyone ask me that before. I haven't had anyone ask me that before. But uh, if it's at the last minute, 
I would really try to get someone to like, like get a witness over there as soon as possible, like physically in person. Uh, just for liability reasons, I wouldn't risk try to have a witness appear on a video chat. Just for my own, just for my own peace of mind and sanity, it'd be probably be better for you to have a person to be physically present. Like I say, it could be like their neighbor, it could be someone that you know, um, it could be anyone that that's like I said that's that's a non that's non partial to these documents. That's a great question. Uh, if it was like for a run, man, if it was, I wouldn't, I'm not going to speak in that because I haven't done a run signing. So I wouldn't know for sure, but I would, I would encourage you to have that witness appear in person just for, like I said, peace of mind and sanity reasons. So let's move on to the next uh, document real quick. It said the will that you're showing now needs to be notarized. Well, no, so this will, so this will in particular does not need to be notarized. Uh, write this down. The last will and testament the last will and testament. The last will and testament, that document needs to be notarized. If he's if you just see a document where it just says the will, typically it doesn't need to be notarized. But if you see the if you see a document called the last will and testament, which is sort of similar to the document, that needs to be notarized. The funding acknowledgement. So this is another common document that you're going to come across. <clears throat> In the estate plan signing, a uh, reason why I included this document it is again because when you're dealing with estate plan attorneys, especially if you want to earn their business um, on a continuous basis, they they always want to get scan backs of these of these signature and notarized pages just to confirm that this they, they were completed. And this is a document that you're commonly going to see. So again, this is the funding acknowledgement, and this document is just um, this document is for the signer. It's just it's just them acknowledging. Uh, that they know that this fund, that their living trust needs to be funded, has to be funded, whether it's through life insurance, whether it's through investment accounts, whether it's from assets, real estate related, their trust needs to be funded. And they're just acknowledging uh, that they received this document. And they, they're, again, they're just acknowledging that they, that, they were, that they were advised that their trust needs to be funded. After that, again, it's, all, it's already gonna have the date in there for the, uh, for the signers. And then we just need a signature. And that's how you will complete the funding acknowledgement. So the next common document that you're going to come across, uh, this is also called the, it's the assignment of personal property, also known as the general assignment of personal property as well. So this document is stating <clears throat> uh, that they're going to have their personal property listed inside their trust. So per personal property could be like jewelry, your new Jordans, um, Collectibles, anything that's that's yours, TV, you can have. You'll have that. You'll have those uh, that personal property listed inside a tr inside your trust, and you're going to have instructions in place for uh, in regards for who gets what. Uh, so a second uh, part of this document, uh, Schedule C. I don't have a listed inside here, but you'll see Schedule C will have like a list of their uh, personal property or belongings that's going to be listed inside that document, and it's going to be inside the trust. So once they're done reviewing this document, it's going to ask for their signature. And of course, you need to notarize this document as well. And for trustee verbiage, where it says a signer, again, follow up with the attorney to confirm if this type of trustee verbiage is required, along with their signature. But just from my experience, typically it's not required. All right. So let's move on. And next, the most another common document that you're going to come across that we see quite often in loan signings. This is the preliminary change of ownership report. Uh, this document is, I, sh I should have actually had the, the I should actually should have had the, the showing you guys the other document first, but it comes right after this. So whenever you're dealing with a, uh, with a, with a signer, they may have, when they set, they're setting up their trust, they may have assets, uh, they may have their home, they're gonna transfer the title of, from their personal name into the name of their trust. So whenever you see that happen, you, you can expect the preliminary change of ownership report to come along with the estate plan because they have to record the deed, the new deed, uh, record the new deed at the county, and this is required. So if you ever, so if you're dealing with a, again, you have an estate plan signing, this is you're typically not going to have to fill this in. This is already going to be filled in for you. It is kind of cool, right? Because if it was, if we was doing a loan closing, we would have to have the signers fill this in, but because they the, the attorney pretty much does the majority of the work for you, they're already gonna have this information uh, pre-populated for you ahead of time. So this will be filled, in, filled out, part two, part three will be filled out. 
it is, depending on who you're working with, part four may or may not be filled out. But if it is, but if it is filled out, the last one that's going, the, the last, I would say the last box you will probably see open will be uh, if the property produces rental inc rental or other income. <clears throat> and then you would just have the signers check either one of those boxes. And you will also have them check uh, one either one of these boxes as well, if it applies to them. So in this section, it's going to ask for their signature. If it's two signers, you, if it's two signers that you're working with, you're going to have them. You're going to have them provide this uh, their signatures here. This this section will, probably, will typically be pre-populated for you. It's going to have their printed name. You'll have the date. Now, if you see this section title where is where is blank, typically it says trustee. If uh, if you like, depending on who you're working with. But if you see if it's blank, always have the signers uh, print trustee. And then telephone, uh, email, telephone number, email address, and then that's how you will complete the section for the um, preliminary change of ownership report. Signature, printed name, today's date, title will be trustee or co-trustee, telephone number and email address, and that's how you would complete uh, the preliminary change of ownership report. And the last one, I think I had another one. I thought I had another document. Hold on, y'all. Thought I had another one. Do I have another document? Yes, I do. Oh. I'm missing a document. Oh, no. Where is it? The next, uh, I don't think I have it on here, y'all. Sorry. But the next document that, that I was going to show you guys is the, uh, it's called the Grant Deed to Revocable Trust. Uh, you could, I may I'm I may end up uploading this into uh to a state plan sign on one on one after this class is over, but the document that you will come across that that comes along with this document is called the grant deed to revocable trust. So again, the grant deed to revocable trust is basically stating that it's basically just the signers transferring their their name the name on their changing the title on their property from their personal name into the into their trust name. And then depending on, again, the attorney that you're working with, they'll typically either have you send this document along with the grant deed back to the law firm. So that way they can take that, take those documents over to the county and they can uh, record the deed. All right. So those were the documents uh, that, that, that you're commonly going to see in the trust. So next, let's get into some Q&A. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to turn your mic on or just drop your questions in the chat. And then we'll go from there. No questions? Hey, Rafael, I did have a quick question. How are you doing tonight? Hey, what's going on, brother? Hey, uh, what's the big difference between a last will and testament and just um, just the will? Is that uh, just from my understanding? That, I mean, I, I really couldn't give you a real clear answer on what's the differences between the two. I could just tell you, only, only, the only thing I could really tell you is that the will, like I said, in here in California, it does need to be notarized. But if you come across the last will and testament, that document typically needs to be notarized. So I don't know why why those differences are with it, why they are, but I mean, that's typically the case. Uh, what I will do though, is I think I may have a copy of the last will. I'll upload that up into the class along with the grand deed to revocable trust as well. Thank you. Yep. I have a quick question. I'm um, mm -hmm. going back to the uniform or the power, the power of attorney, the first page. Mm -hmm. And then I think the, the California advanced healthcare directive. Yep. Do you, both of these need to be notarized? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they always need yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, the reason why I didn't, I didn't include additional, like, because I showed the first certificate, but I didn't want to be repetitive and just keep showing y'all the same Makes sense. acknowledgement forms. But yeah, yeah, it tell me, yeah, that always needs to be notarized. Hi, I have a question. Um, so um as a notary, we will know we have to notarize because after the signature, uh, a notary certificate will appear, right? Or how will we know what has to be notarized? So that's 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 really a, that's a great question as well. Uh, so when you're dealing with uh, the majority of state planning attorneys, there, like I said, they'll have the they are they will already have the, the acknowledgement or jury certificates included inside the package. So so more so more times than not, you won't have to bring like you 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 should always always have extras already. 
but in most cases, or in the majority of the cases, that the, the attorney is going to include the acknowledgement forms in the in the uh, in the estate plan package. Any more questions? Um, just I guess for the sake of avoidance, what mm -hmm. were specific? And I don't know if you mentioned this already, but like specific mistakes that you were seeing um, that kind of brought you to today. <laughs> this document, the will. Oh, okay. Yeah, this document. Uh, out of all the documents, this document usually comes back with the most common mistakes, and even in. And I, and, I have to, and I haven't included any instructions as well in the confirmation email, but it still comes back when mistakes made. So yeah, for this for this document, um, they know how to fill it out, but that the missing piece is having a second witness. So yeah, you, you as a notary can serve as a witness, but again, for the will, it typically requires two witnesses. So uh, we were missing a second with, yeah, we had three signings last week where we missed the, the second witness signature, their printed name, and their address as well. So yeah, this is typically this document is typically the hold up. So that's the reason why I want to have this class today. So you guys know. So when you guys have your signings, you'll know how this uh doc how this document is supposed to be uh, properly filled out. So in the case, for example, that they don't have the principal, they don't have like anyone um as a witness, mm -hmm. is that like for example, you had mentioned maybe like upsell them by provide having your own witness. So that would basically be me, the notary, providing two witnesses in that case. Uh, in that sense, uh, you would probably just you would just probably you would need to present just one witness because you because you would be serving as a witness for the signing. So you would just need to provide just an additional witness. Does but doesn't this need to be notarized though? No. So so for this 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 document in particular, the will doesn't need to be notarized. But if you come across a document, what is called the last will and testament. Mm, that document needs to be notarized. So I can just reaffirming, I can serve as a witness and notarize for just this will and then provide my own other witness in the case they don't have a witness. This does not need to be notarized and the last like will will need to be notarized. Right. So let, let, yeah, so let me reiterate the will. This doesn't need to be notarized here in California. It doesn't need to be notarized, but it does require two witnesses. Now, if you come across the last will and testament, that document does need that document does require two witnesses, and it needs to be notarized as well. So, if you do the last will again, you can notarize it. But if they had, let's say, if they need, if they don't have two witnesses present, uh, then from there that could be opportunity for you to add what, probably additional seventy four bucks just for providing two witnesses for that document. So, yeah. Does the last, yep, I just answered that question for you. <laughs> yeah, the last will and uh, the last will and testament does require two witnesses as well. Uh, see, Chanel has her hand raised. Go ahead, Chanel. Hello, uh, good evening, everybody. Would you say uh, notaries that have experience doing uh, wills, power of attorney, generally that you wouldn't see these type of errors come back? Because I've done a lot of these wills and power of attorneys in the state of New York. So I'm familiar with a lot of these documents. This is why I chose to go the estate planning route because I see this a lot and I have a lot of clients I've done that with. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, I think you hit the nail on the head. The reason why you see like mistakes on this document is because most notaries, uh, and this is not a knock on, like on, I don't want this to sound like it's a knock on um, most notaries, but just the most the majority of them do mostly loan closings. Okay. So, if, so, if, so the majority of the time, if the majority of the time be doing loan closings, then I just spring. You have someone offer you the opportunity to do an estate plan signing, and you take on the signing, and you haven't had, and this is probably your first one. You haven't done any training. Uh, this is going to be a great chance that a mistake is going to be made. So that's why we have these type of classes where, like I said, we, even though you may not be doing estate plan signings, but we want to help you get familiar with these documents. So that way, you know, once you do go to the signing table, you're going to feel more. You're going to feel much very confident in your process. And if you, if the documents go back to the attorney and that's, there's no mistakes that have been made and you provided a great experience uh, for the signers, that's the opportunity for you to follow up with that attorney and to see if this is if this is a service that they typically need all the time and see if they uh, don't have a go-to notary. 
You know, so if you don't make any mistakes and this and it's a flawless signing, then again, that's an opportunity for you to follow up with them and see how you could turn them into a, a to a long term VP client. Okay, understood. Yep. Thank you. Uh, we got. I think we got two more hands. We got. I got two more questions, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap up for tonight. I think I have seen Rosa, Rosalind's hand up. Yes, it is. It's Rosalind. Rosalind, uh, sorry about that. No, you are fine. First, I just want to thank you for getting this all together and taking the time. Um, but my question, I was about five minutes late, so I don't know if you already covered this or not. But mm -hmm. so, where am I marketing this service, sure. estate planning? Great question. Uh, so, few a uh, couple of platforms that you want to use is I like to use Thumbtack. Um, Thumbtack is is always crawling with uh, opportunities for estate plan signings because they, the attorneys typically either leaving it up to the paralegal or the legal assistant to find a notary, or they typically going to look for themselves. Uh, number two uh, is referrals. Uh, I always recommend establishing a referral partnership with a um, with a financial advisor. Um, typically, when financial advisors are setting up their set, setting up life insurance policies uh, for their clients, they're typically referring those clients over to an estate planning attorney. So if you know people who, if you know someone who could benefit from having a conversation about life insurance, or they just have questions about uh, just their financial matters in general, you can refer that person, refer that person to that uh, financial advisor that you know and trust. And if you start, and if you're sending them referrals and they're closing on that business, you want to ask if they have any relationships with any estate plan attorneys, and you want to see how you can get an introduction. Now, if you send them referrals, they're going to make the introduction because, again, they want your business. So that's another way to get uh, to get a state plan signed a business. Uh, number three, uh, Google. Google has been very clutch for me. I want to say since the third the, since the third quarter, uh, just me being very active on posting on my page, um, giving getting getting reviews as well. Um, so that's how I've been able to get businesses. Um, just getting the reviews and have seen having attorneys just happen to, to attract to my business. So also social media, LinkedIn has been very helpful. I got a referral. I was referred to by an estate plan attorney um, recently because of, uh, from, from, a, from a post that I guess that one of their peers saw on my LinkedIn page. So social media. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple. The same way you would get business for everyone. Referrals, um, uh, outreach, um, referral partnerships and then the social media and then also utilizing your Google page as well. Uh, I said the last one. Yeah, and I have all that information inside the, uh, if anyone doesn't have it inside the actual course on how to market the service as well. Uh, I got quite quite time for one more question. We're going to wrap up, y'all. Anyone got one more question? Last one before we wrap up. I think I have a question regarding like kind of cold calling. Um, mm -hmm. Is that would has that been effective? I guess would you say if that's been effective, or is that an effective method calling attorneys and kind of giving a pitch? Or in the case, do they mostly already have a notary? You know, like a that they use. So that's a great question. Um, I like to say all strategies work. It's just a matter of just finding one thing that works for you and spamming it until it doesn't work anymore. So I've done cold calling before. Uh, I did it for like a couple of weeks, probably I want to say in the first quarter of the year when I was just calling up attorney offices. And the person who I was coming across on the phone was pretty much the paralegal or the legal assistant. And so I do have a inside, I don't know if you have it, estate plan signing one-on-one definitely has the call script that you can use to call the attorneys. And they're also- Huh? I say, yeah, I got that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if you, if you go to lawyer, I think it's lawyers.findlaw.com. If you type in estate plan attorneys, it'll give you a list of estate plan attorneys that's in your area. And it'll also give you the names of the people that actually work at the firm as well. So again, the person who you want to look for, if you are going to cold call is for the, uh, is, uh, you want to ask for the legal assistant or paralegal. Now, my opinion, cold calling, that's not a, it's not a, it's not a long-term marketing strategy in my opinion because you want to have the clients come to you but in the event like say when you first just getting started and you want to get your name out there you just want to let these uh let these assistants know like hey if you ever need help if you want to save if you want to i help notaries i hope well, i can help save you i can help save you valuable and billable time from trying to find a notary whenever you have a signing come up 
they leave it up to me and I can handle the rest. So yeah, you want to do that until you at least get one or two consistent clients. And then at that point, you probably will need to cold call no more unless you want to. But if you do want to pursue that, like I said, I do have the script for you and then the actual website that you can go on. So that way you can find the leads. Yeah. Oh, and what's the website? I think I may have had the... It's lawyers.findlaw.com. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's all. That was it um, for today. Appreciate you all for showing up for today's class. This was pretty cool. Um, hopefully you guys got a lot of value from this. I'm hoping that you were ready to hit the ground running to start booking some of these assignments yourself. Um, again, like I said, this, this field is wide open, wide open for opportunity. So really encourage you to really soak in the information, dig in and just go execute. Uh, if you don't have the course already, uh, it's still available. You can still pay, you can pay whatever you want to get access to the course. Uh, like I said, I'll upload these sample documents into, up until into the course at midnight. And I'll uh, also get to try to include the grant deed to revocable trust and the last will and testament as well. So be on the lookout for that at midnight. Um, before I wrap up, what else we got? Oh, sorry, Bill. Thank you all. It's my pleasure. Thank you guys for getting value out of this as well. Also, before I leave, um, if you guys want to start, if you guys want to learn how to book uh, jail signings, we got a new course that'll be that'll be that I'll be dropping at midnight uh, for you to learn how to book jail signings. Most notaries that I come across, they get calls for jail signings and they don't know what to do at all. So I'm going to break down the entire process on how to book the appointments with the jails, who you need to call, how to how what to charge for those type of signings or whatnot as well. You can go to the website again, pay whatever you want from the class. It's available for pre-sale, and jail signing one on one will be will be available at midnight as well. So if y'all got any value from this, uh, please leave me a solid review. Uh, I'm open to constructive criticism as well. This helps me get better as well. So if it's negative or positive, just let me know. Other than that, appreciate y'all. Peace. He said, what was the, uh, I'll give you the website one more time. It's lawyers. No, yeah, it's lawyers.finelaw.com, I believe. Lawyers.finelaw.com. You're welcome. All right, y'all, be on the lookout for it. It's at midnight. I'm going get to get this uploaded, y'all. Peace.